so now we're going to introduce Liz Weaver. Liz, you're no stranger to New Zealand. Um, we Many of us enjoyed your presentations when Inspiring Communities invited you over on behalf of Tamarack Institution, Institute to really present to us, some, for many of us, for the first time, the notions of what collective impact could, can achieve. Um, something that Maureen com commented on last week, it's quite astonishing how quickly uh, this debate, this topic has picked up globally. It's quite astonishing how many countries are now linked in. And I think you felt it when you were here. There are people wanting to know and there are groups who are interested to collaborate um, and interested to hear from your reflections so that you can pass on what you have learned to us in uh, Tamarack Institution in Canada. Well, so Liz, I'm going to invite you now to talk us through your understanding of how does a group in New Zealand uh, approach the topic of collective impact and get to measures of success. Great. Well, thank you, Jan. And um, you. hopefully I'll be able to uh, manage this technology and get uh, my PowerPoint up. Um, so okay. okay. That's great. Here. We'll click through Let it me... here. Oh, okay. Here we go. Can you see this now? Yes. Okay, perfect. I can work this from my side now. Great. Okay, here we go. So sorry about those technical problems, everybody. We're learning as we're going. I'm going to just jump through the first couple of slides relatively quickly. Uh, um, Jan has done a great job in introducing everybody. Um, just to let you know, this is my picture for those of you that signed on a little bit later. And these are the three websites that Tamarack sponsors in terms of our work. And you can follow up with them uh, later on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about collective impact. So the whole idea of collective impact started in 2011, as we've talked about, and it really is this notion of moving from isolated impact where individual grantees are working separately from one another. And um, really the, um, the whole idea of impact is really focused on the individual organization as opposed to the, uh, the large scale organization. Sorry. Um, collective impact is really all about us working together where there's cross-sector alignment where we're bringing in uh, multiple individuals from different sectors and that organizations are actually actively coordinating their work to get towards impact. It's used, uh, we're seeing it emerge in many, uh, many areas um, and these are just a few of them in Canada and the United States and I'm sure that you're seeing them in the US as, or sorry, in New Zealand as well. Um, for those of you that have heard me present before, I usually start with these framing questions. They're really critical questions in terms of thinking about is your work collective impact work? They really um, help you frame um, an understanding of is this something that we should be, you know, using the collective impact framework for, or is it a more simple problem that, you know, collaboration would work, but we're not necessarily um, going to go fully into collective impact. The first and fourth question are really critical because they are data questions, right? The first question asks the table to find out, you know, what is the change that we want to see? And do we want to move the needle, whether it's on educational outcomes or on poverty or on um, child outcomes? Do we want to move the needle by more than 10%? And it says we need to know what the needle is. And then, you know, the whole idea of using measurable data as we go forward. Um, as you can see in this slide, the collective impact actually uh, happens across four phases. Um, and these phases uh, don't happen in synchronicity. They kind of, they happen all at the same time and you move from one to the one. What's really interesting is the bottom of this slide, evaluation and improvement should guide um, your work throughout the all four phases. So as you know, there are some preconditions for collective impact, the whole idea of influential champions. Urgency of the issue ties us back to that whole data question. So what do we know about the issue? And then what is the change that we want to see? And what is our theory of change around the issue? And then recognizing that we need to have new conversations with funders um, to say that we need to resource our collective impact work. 
Um, from the three preconditions, there are these five conditions of collective impact. And uh, for this webinar, we're really going to focus on the idea of shared measurement. But the other conditions are equally important. A common agenda really tells us, you know, this is uh, our aspiration. This is the theory of change that we have. And these are the things that we're going to work on together to really solve the issue that we're trying to work on. Shared measurement we'll get into in a minute. Mutual reinforcing activities are really those activities that will help you move not only on your common agenda but also in the shared measurement and then when you bring multiple partners together you've got to focus on continuous communication across the partners and the backbone support is really you know the the um, infrastructure that it takes to move forward collaboratively I wanted to do, this is actually a little bit of new thinking. Shared measurement is only one part of evaluating your collective impact approach. So it is one small subset within a broader um, thing. When you're thinking about collective impact, you want to be measuring all of the five conditions and the three preconditions. You want to understand or evaluate. You want to evaluate, you know, um, uh, do we have a common agenda and to what degree is there buy-in to our common agenda? You know, um, backbone, are we able to raise the resources that was, are really required to make the backbone effective? Shared measurement is part of an overall approach to evaluation in terms of collective impact. So shared measurement, what is it exactly? Well, shared measurement is really identifying and capturing those key measures that are critical to um, showing that your, uh, your collective impact work is actually making a difference. It's also making sure that you have the systems in place for gathering data and for analyzing the measures. And then finally, it's really creating those sense-making opportunities around the indicators that, um, that you've chosen, that the collective impact work um, shows that you are making progress. Um, so some of the things you want to put into your design, you want to have a good understanding, as I've said already, around the issues and data. You want to be able to map who's already doing what in your community and how those can be, depending on who's doing what, how they can be leverage points for change. You want to get an understanding of, you know, the 10 to 15 indicators that will really show that you are making progress and really start to understand, you know, um, of these indicators, which indicators are most useful to us and are collected at the rate of time that we need them and with the uh, level of consistency that would be helpful to us. You want to provide opportunities for learning. If you see an indicator, let's say high school graduation rates, despite the fact that your group is working really hard, you're seeing um, rather than an increase in high school graduation rates, you're seeing a decrease in graduation rates. You want to kind of have a sense-making opportunity for your group to say, well, what other factors are impacting us whether we're moving forward on this? And then finally, you really want to focus on what is the impact that we're making on our community. I'm going to take you through a really quick example of this. Uh, this is the roadmap project and this is really um, an example, this is my first example that looks at population level indicators. This roadmap uh, project is a cradle to career education focused initiative and you can see at the bottom the four focus points that they have on theirs. They actually have identified two levels of indicators. The first level of indicators, so you can see in each of the four areas they have um, either one or three, up to three indicators that they're tracking in each of the four um, areas of domain that they're very interested in. So this is first level and then they have a second level set of indicators. And these indicators really inform their first level of indicators. So when you look back at, you know, the percentage of children ready to succeed in school and kindergarten, they're also informed by, you know, children being born weighing less than 5.5 pounds. So they are really looking at all those indicators within the zero to five years that really get kids um, ready to get ready for school and uh, be able to be supported and successful in school. So those indicators, the second level indicators, or what they call the contributing indicators are elements of um, how they really thought through their indicator process. Um, 
When uh, FSG started looking at indicators, they identified a number of tips and tricks to bear in mind, particularly looking at these higher level indicators. And they said, you know, really, you should limit the number of manageable indicators to 15, a maximum of 15, and that you need to establish a set of criteria that really guide the identification and prioritization of these indicators. And, and those criteria will will be things like how often is this data collected? How accessible is this data to us? If we're working at a neighborhood level, is this data relevant at the neighborhood level or do we only get it at the citywide level? So you need to figure out, you know, those criteria that will guide you to say, yes, this is a good indicator for us or no, it actually doesn't fit our needs. The second um, thing to think of, to keep in mind is how are you going to collect and present the data? Um, you know, in Canada, if we're using uh, Census uh, Statistics Canada Census data, we only get that data released to us every five years, and it's usually um, at least two to three years after the census data is collected. So, you know, it might be that. Um, uh, we want data from, let's say, 2013. Well, we wouldn't necessarily get that until 2015, 2016. And then we really need to ask ourselves, well, how relevant is that um, given, you know, what we're looking at in our community conditions right now? And so we might use different kind of data that will help uh, really inform our current conditions as opposed to what the census data might have and then finally, um, the uh, FSG suggests that you really need to look at who in your community is already uh, um, collecting data, particularly around population level data, indicator data, and then really consider um, building a voluntary team of data experts to really help you um, identify the data that you require, but also if they're already collecting the data, perhaps you could leverage the data that they're already collecting for the work that you're working on. Um, here are some questions that we think are really helpful in terms of really thinking through, uh, particularly around shared measurement, and again, this is uh, more biased towards uh, population level data, but you know, could be used for um, some of the other levels of indicators that uh, you might be collecting. So, you know, who's collecting it? How effective is the data source? What resources will we need to build our data capacity? And then finally, the, and I think the most important question of all is, does this measure actually help us move um, on our collective impact agenda? I think um, we were going to stop for questions here, but I think what I'll do is I'll go through the presentation and I'll take questions at the end just because I know that we've had some uh, technical challenges this morning. Um, so this is our second example. It's uh, vibrant communities and this is how we've landed on shared measurement. Of course, we're looking at population level data, um, but we also look at three other types of data that we collect. We, we um, call them our 4P process. We call this our 4P process. We look at process, program, policy, and population level data. And we've given you some examples of, um, of uh, data that we collect, particularly around poverty reduction. For those of you that are working um, with RBA, results-based accountability, you'll notice that program and population, that is the domain of RBA, right? So they're trying to link program outcomes with population level changes. And so this, um, this example really does give you an approach that uh, brings in the ideas behind RBA as well, or some of the theory behind RBA as well. Um, so getting, uh, here are just some thoughts in terms of getting to shared outcomes. I think that shared outcomes can be, invite, be identified in all four quadrants of collaborative change. And I think, you know, if we go back to the previous slide, process and policy outcomes are really important outcomes, particularly if you're, you know, you're working on long-term and systemic uh, change areas. The other thing is that I think um, partners really do need to be uh, engaged in identifying and contributing to shared outcomes. And 
we found in our um, poverty reduction work in Canada um, that the more you can get your partners engaged in both identifying the outcomes and then figuring out you know, what data they're collecting that can contribute to the outcomes, the more buy-in you'll get and the more attention people will pay to these kind of shared outcomes and these shared measures. Um, I think that uh, what we've learned also is that the collaborative table is only one of multiple contributors to um, shared uh, progress on shared measures, but that you also have to keep track of that. You have to say, you know, here's uh, a particular Clearly with population level outcomes, here are the changes that we're observing and here's what we've done as a collective impact initiative to contribute to that change. And we used a tool called an outcomes diary, which was a really great tool to, um, to figure out in each of the four quadrants, what changes were we observing and what was the contribution um, of the round table of uh, our poverty tables to this work. Um, this uh, next slide that I've brought up is really just an opportunity to um, share with you a little bit of some of the changes that we're observing, some of the new thinking around collective impact. Um, so the conditions, the three preconditions and the five conditions, what we've seen them become are simple rules for complex interventions, right? So the conditions we know, you know, common agenda, shared measurement, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communications, and backbone, they're simple concepts, but it is really challenging in terms of the application. And that the issues that we're trying to turn the curve on are these very complex kind of interventions. We've also noticed that you need a different kind of mindset, right? That the problems um, that typically collective impact work is trying to um, tackle is more adaptive. They're more adaptive problems. They shift in terms of context. And so you've got to work differently. You've got to say, you know, this is an adaptive problem. We're not necessarily sure that it will take the exact path that a logic model kind of problem will take. So how do we really learn as we go? Uh, the third concept with collective impact is this notion of structure. You really do have to be intentional and predetermined about your structure. Who do you have at the table? What is the design of your common agenda and your shared measures? Be as intentional as you can be in terms of those um, uh, structures and then learn from them as you go. And then um, there has to be a process behind this. So you have to go deep, you have to see the problem from a systems perspective, um, and then finally leadership. It really does take um, a different kind of leader to do this work. It takes a systems leader who has a commitment to the health of the whole. I'm going to um, uh, stop there. There is just one slide uh, of an event that we're holding in the next little while on, uh, on evaluating community impact that I wanted to um, put up for you. And then there are a couple of slides um, after this that you'll get when you get the slides, which really talk about um, uh, some additional resources if you uh, want to dive deeper, a little deeper into um, getting to shared outcomes and collective impact. So I'm going to turn it back to you, uh, Jen, at this Website. point. Okay. Thanks so much, Liz. Thanks for the, I mean, we really feel that you've given a pro comprehensive overview there. You've sort of given us the theory and an understanding of collective impact. I mean, there are many people, and we think there are many groups here who understand themselves to be working collectively, but it's not necessarily the same thing as those five preconditions of collective impact, which actually is a, has quite a rigor and a methodology to it um, and, and, and makes the difference between successful practice and less than successful practice at some, some Time. So uh, um, I'm still inviting people to uh, send your questions in for Liz because we can still take questions. Um, but my first one for you there, Liz, is maybe for a group that's considering going down this route, considering um, uh, going down the tracks of collective impact, what are the things to watch out for um, and when doesn't it work where shared measures are concerned? 
Yeah, you know, I think um, you're, you're absolutely right, Jen. It is the collective impact. So we've all been collaborating for the longest time, and some of us might even think that we're working, you know, under the framework of collective impact. Collective impact is really all five of the conditions mm. working together. I think, um, you know, the things that I don't think are collective impact are if you are working in a single sector or you're working across two sectors. So, for example, you're partnering with government or you're just working with voluntary sector partners. That's, that's collaboration and it is great, but it isn't collective impact. Collective impact is when you bring in diverse sectors to the table, you know, and partners that you wouldn't necessarily have partnered with before. And it's where you also are paying attention to the measures. The, you know, the, not only the common agenda, but what are the measures that um, will show that you're making progress and also how will you, as a table, start to really understand and look at those things that are moving the needle on the measures and those activities that are nice activities but not necessarily moving on the measures. Thank you, Liz. So we've had a f couple of questions um, come through now. And the first, a couple of you, um, a number of questions come through. Some people are asking about, Liz, could you talk to us about the backbone organizations? What kind of agency typically are they? Does there need to be a backbone organization? And, and, and also, how does the backbone organization work without becoming the power base over the other partners? Yeah, it's interesting, right, because the backbone has to be in service to the, the collective impact table, right? And so mm -hmm. um, we have tended to use backbone infrastructure now rather than organization because organization is confusing. And the way that we, we see a backbone is that it's usually one or two staff or three staff that are working in service of the collective impact table to move it forward. Um, they're usually housed in a uh, uh, either a not-for-profit organization or a funder, um, so they do have reporting requirements to that funder or to that not-for-profit organization, but their real attention is to the people that are gathered around the collective impact table that have, um, have the desire to move this kind of systems-wide or community-wide issue forward, whether it's mm. high school graduation rates or neighborhood revitalization or, you know, poverty, whatever the issue is, it's the table that's moving it forward and backbone are the staffing that are really working for the table. And we're going to hear from an interesting initiative that have more, has more of a collective structure just shortly. Um, but I'm going to respond to some questions that have come in. Um, you've asked about other resources. Some people are saying, can we see some other resources for outcomes measurements? And we will show you some examples on our website later. Uh, will this be recorded? Yes, it will, and that will be available. And there will be a PowerPoint. Um, uh, there will be um, uh, also um, documentation up on our website after the event. But Liz, let me put one more question to you as well, because I can see okay. people are curious to know about the whole outcomes agenda and how we gain some power and some independence as a sector when there's such heat coming from government on us to be reporting outcomes. And I'd also like to ask you if, if, if you could just to talk a little bit more about how those four kinds of outcomes come to play there so that we're learning for ourselves and we're not just reporting to funders. Yeah, I think, you know, that's always an interesting question, right? Um, because, in fact, funders play a role. They want us to get, as communities, to get to outcomes, and, and that's, a, that's a really important role. But I do think that we do need to say, okay, so it isn't our individual organizational outcomes. We're really trying to, collective impact is really what it is, right? Collective. This is our community's outcomes that, that we're trying to get to. And, you know, our individual organizations might be contributing in one way or another to getting to those outcomes, but there would be many other partners that would be contributing as well. And so it really is not only thinking about, you know, what is this collaborative table doing to contribute to these outcomes, but then who are the others that are contributing? And if you think about, you know, something, so in a, an example I can give you is um, in Ontario, the government of Ontario was considering a poverty reduction strategy a number of years ago. And um, as they were doing that, a lot of partners um, across the province of Ontario 
were engaged in holding con consultations and participating with government in terms of the design of the poverty strategy, as were the poverty roundtables that were involved with vibrant communities in Tamarack. And so we wanted, ultimately, the province did land on a poverty strategy, and it had certain elements in it that um, were part of what the poverty roundtables had um, asked for, but they weren't the only players that had asked for those kinds of relevant, those kinds of elements in the uh, uh, poverty strategy. So what you need to do while you're when you're working at policy and systems change is to not only um, track what you're doing, but also track you know all the times that you contributed to it. But then I guess also acknowledge that there are others that are also contributing to this change, right? Um, there's a great tool that we use at Tamarack called uh, Contribution Analysis, and so we can um, we'll add a link into our PowerPoint or or send a link to you, Jan, um, of how you can use that tool to look at what is the contribution that our table made to this larger change. That's fantastic, Liz. And I look forward to that resource. And also, other people are putting questions to you about um, what are the models for yeah. possibly gathering data, and what are the, some other questions that are being put to us around people's experiences of actually setting up. So whilst we can't take all of those questions, we are going to show you some examples, particularly from other countries, of where there have been really interesting overviews and analyses of based on practical case studies, based on people who are doing the work on the ground. So, so for those of you who are wanting now to know more about, about the possible models, because of course they are diverse, we're going to point you to some resources later. But now, um, it's a oh, great pleasure to introduce... Oh yes, Liz. Back so to one, one final thing I should mention, yes. Jen, is that mm -hmm. um, FSG will also... Um, so the authors of Collective Impact yes. are developing a resource on shared measurement that will be coming out um, later this spring, and once it's available, right. um, we'll also uh, connect you to it so that um, folks in um, in New Zealand will be able to get access to that resource as well. That should be out probably March or April. That's fantastic, Liz. Thank you. And FSG is certainly uh, doing a lot of the leading thinking, um, which is informing us as a sector at the moment. Um, <clears throat> closer to home. And I'm delighted now to introduce Maureen Gillen, who, uh, Maureen, you've had a very interesting journey of late because not only have you been there at the coalface, oh, seeing how a practical initiative of the Shine Collective came about through what appears to have been a, you know, a very disparate group of voices, not only because uh, many of them working in education sector where there's absolute competition for funds, very disparate groups, groups competing for the same funds, but also you've worked with education, non-profit and private sector initiatives to really get a collective, collaborative approach going in the Shine collective in Porirua and also you yourself have been over to the Kettering Institute to gather some more information so that you can bring that back. So really our question for you is now that we've had the sort of the theory and the appliance of sciences, how did you go about it? Talk us through how you got to your shared measures approach at the shared Shine Collective approach. in at the Shine Collective in Porirua. Right. Um, in Porirua we have a long history of um, issues with educational outcomes, and the um, the stats showed um, the results for us. But the educators in Porirua were aware of the issues and were very keen to make a difference. They um, were linked to the Mana Education Trust, which was the catalyst for this change. So when we talk about the preconditions. The educators really drove this. They saw the opportunity. So the evidence coming out showed that there was there were some successes with community and education sectors working quite closely together to improve children's outcomes. So they um, they they really um, were the key catalyst. They wanted to to work towards a summit to invite other people to participate. And so I was asked to share that initiative. Um, the, the, 
the summit really was again of a wider strategic collaboration where people start, began to identify the different roles and relationships. So it, the, one of the issues that came out of the summit was the commitment from the mayor um, in the long-term council community plan, children and children and young people being the key focus. And the the clear message was that they wanted young people and um, the people at the summit wanted young people in Porirua to shine. Um, that's the the name shine. And we we also uh, were reminded that if we were going to do anything about education in Porirua, that it had to be about the kids. That they they were important and that they needed to be involved in any activity that was going on. So we, we began to, to ask questions and I, I guess the, the, the key issue for us was how will we know children in Porirua are shining and what, what are the sorts of things that we need to think about. And the starting, uh, one of the key starting points was identifying the culture of the system and creating a framework that was inclusive and um, took the different perspectives in, into consideration. So we, we um, had a, a, a broad ranging discussion about where to start. Um, I think in, in terms of collecting measures, there are thousands of them out there and you could go in any different direction. So what was the starting point? And so um, we, we took a, a, a different approach, I think. We, we didn't actually begin to talk about measures. We talked about the local system and started thinking about the, the journey and um, some of the relationships in the system, the roles in the system, what resources were available. We talked about the community strengths and what that looked like. So that, that was a conversation between the collaborative partners. And so by the end of that, we, we um, decided that we wanted to learn about the, um, the journey that young people faced in terms of their um, learning. And we thought that we would develop a framework that looked at the transition across the learning continuum. And, and so in terms of where we started, we thought that zero to four was really important. In fact, I, I was just interested to look at the um, group that Liz talked about. Um, let me just find that. Um, because I, I think that we, we've really taken a very similar approach to the, ro the roadmap project. Mm -hmm. And so we measure the transition across the learning continuum, 0 to 4, 5 to 12, 13 to 17, leaving school and after school at 18 to 25. We thought it was also important to understand the entire landscape and the um, issues that um, villages and households were um, facing around the city and discovered there was actually quite a lot of movement around the city. Now we, be, we began to collect information under those transition areas um, as a result of the contributions in the, um, in, in the group of people that began to take part. And in particular, the, the agencies that collect, already collect information, be, began to share information. The Ministry of Education was exemplary, I think. They, they held information that they hadn't used before and they helped develop the information. The, the schools began to talk to each other. The schools and the colleges began to talk to each other. So they began to share information in a way that they hadn't shared before. So that negotiation, the dialogue, the, um, the decisions that were made 
as they identified what information they would share across the across the transition and the learning continuum was amazing to watch. So I, I was um, aware that groups were going away from our meetings and they were um, having their own discussions within their own groups and bringing that information back. So we began to see an increase in the level of participation and contribution. And I think that's really important because it was sensitive information. Um, schools work in, a, I, th I think, a fairly competitive environment. And this was the beginning of the collaborative. If, if um, they had commit, one, they had committed to shine, which is a strategic alliance. Two, if they, if they were going to contribute to the strategic alliance, that meant sharing quite sensitive information about what was happening in their own schools, but they were prepared to do that. So as the information began, began to come in, we began to get information that we hadn't had before <clears throat> about student achievement, about retention, about reading co um, comprehension, and we began to get a pattern of the sorts of things that um, children were facing over time. And during, during this phase, we get, began to be aware of the importance of child health and welfare within the um, landscape measures. And the fact that we needed to know more about how that affected the transition phases across the continuum. And for example, are children fit for learning when they start school? You know, that, that's a big one. Children's experiences of um, whether they ha um, experienced good health, health and were in a fit state to learn. And so we discovered that there were some issues across the continuum, but actually that the zero to four was an important benchmark because the um, fit to learn aspect was going to affect them right through their learning cycle. So I remember when we were talking about this just last week, Liz. Um, so I, I know talking to you about this last week, Liz, and you I were know saying that meant talking to you about this last week, Liz, and you were saying that meant that you were actually looking for data across a whole range of sources. So part of the piece of work there, as far as collaboration was concerned, as well, was to work with whatever data and benchline measures already existed in the area. And you had quite an interesting experience of how that actually worked for you practically, didn't you? Yes, well, well, I think the um, the benchmark the benchmark data was very interesting because it began other conversations and what people started to say was well actually there are some very clear patterns forming and it's around literacy, digital enablement, and youth transition, and so once once we had the measures that actually led to a focus on the. Um, activity within the system and so we now have um, individuals who have set up projects around youth literacy and uh, um, the literacy work for example includes 22 schools in our area. We have um, all the educators involved and they're beginning to begin measuring um, children's journey. So, and, we have, and, and we have some questions coming through for you here. So I think people are very intrigued at this whole collaborative approach as well because I know with those diverse data sources you really had to go and shop around across different agencies to find out what data was there and how good were their measures already, how useful was the data that they had. And, I know and your experience, your experience was, was that it, they, they were, were differently, um, there was different qualities of data there. Now, uh, some of the questions coming through for you. Did you engage all of the principals in the process? Um, uh, did they want to be engaged? And if not, how did you go about that? Um, the Mana Education Trust has a relationship with all the educators in the area. And so um, each, each um, cohort has a um, like a, a key principal who's involved with that particular group. So for the secondary school teachers, for example, there was one representative and she would go back and talk to her people. Now, initially, 
there was a great deal of scepticism, but on the day of the summit, most um, principals indicated that they were very interested in participating. Um, we we have not gone out to seek uh, to seek um, to to try and twist people's arms, but what we have done is is to enable the the work to continue. And I think over time, people are becoming more interested and. The work around the um, youth, around the literacy project, for example, has engaged 22 schools in our area, and I, I think um, we only have one school at the moment that actually didn't register on time. I, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's just the one. And so they're looking at how they can involve them. So I would say that the, the principals in the, are engaged. And that's been there's another comment there's come a, through here. It even sounds like cluster. how school clusters might work in, in Christchurch. So maybe you have a transferable model there, which may be used by other groups. Now, we said we would keep to time, and we said we, I know we started a little late, but we said we wouldn't run over our 60-minute slot. So I'm going to introduce Stephen Blythe now, who's here with us as well. And um, we're going to close today by letting you know what's already available on the Community Research website. We're going to click you through the site, take you to the Collective Impact webpage, and then let you know about additional resources. Um, the Community Research Office, we're a small national NGO, um, and we aim to assist groups with their learning and their evaluation and research. We have a neat website. We have digital resources. If you're not already signed up for our newsletter, which goes out uh, once every couple of months, then we'd love to hear from you. And on our website, you'll find that we're, this is the place to find out about research and researchers to support the good work that's going on in the Tangata Whenua community and voluntary sector. Um, we're not only digital, we also work face to face and we're there doing more hands-on work on the ground. But um, as far as collective impact is concerned, let's take a look at the community research website. So I'm just going to check with Stephen now and see if the uh, if our screen is up. And but yeah, we've brought that to you now. So um, here's the homepage www.communityresearch.org.nz. And if you click on the resources, that will take you to the Collective Impact Resources page, which we're going to show you now. And if you just scroll down that, um, on this page, well, let's just talk about what this isn't. This isn't intended to be a comprehensive site. There are other organizations who have far more comprehensive resources, such as the one that Liz uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, the Foundation for Social Good have certainly been pulling together some real considerable publications and a blog space and some case studies for those who are getting to shared measures. Um, but this is, we're assuming that um, uh, those groups who are out there in the sector need to quickly know and, and, and be able to quickly find the few key resources resources that will help them further in their journey. It doesn't replace the need for a skilled professional such as an evaluator or a, a, an academic researcher who might work alongside you. Um, uh, uh, however, this is to inform you in your day-to-day -day practice. So you will see that we have, um, we're just on places to find out more there. So there's um, a, a, a conference and workshops coming up in Australia in just a week's time, and you can still book for the workshops that are in the Collective Impact 2014 conference. Some interesting models there and speakers from around the world. Tamarack Institute in Canada, that's uh, Liz's organization, and they have um, webinar and resources. We're just going to scroll back up, actually, Steve. Even. And, um, uh, and also you'll find, for those of you who are working in complex, socially engaged models, um, uh, some, some, some resources to help you with determining your outcomes, and some key documents at the top of the page there that were about um, case studies, some models for collective impact, some analysis and models for those who are wanting to get to shared measures in their practice. Liz, I know you're still there in the background. Um, we're going to ask you just for a final comment from you who has um, traveled extensively in New Zealand. You've seen where the practice is at. You've just come back from your from your conference in America. Maybe we could just invite you in for a final comment uh, for our webinar today. 
Um, so my final my final comment is that it is uh, very exciting the work that's happening in um, in New Zealand. I think that uh, you know as uh, as you guys explore collective impact. I'm going to look more to what Shine is doing. I found that uh, presentation very uh, interesting as well. I think we are we're collectively learning together, and I think community research and inspiring communities are, you know, great leaders in this work, as is um, the work of Shine in New Zealand. And I think um, we'll all learn together. So I'm looking forward to great things coming from New Zealand. And we certainly look forward to that too, Liz. And maybe if we all just switch our cameras back on and give people a wave to say, we're looking forward to continuing to work collaboratively with you. And also for those of you who've been listening today, if you've any more questions, if you'd like to tell us about the tools that you're using, if you'd like to tell us where you're at with your collective impact journey so that we can better resource you and help to direct you towards the expertise that you need, do get in touch with us. And we're going to stay, we're going to stay uh, live just between the three of us now for half an hour just to take any questions that you have and to make sure that we can get back to you following this presentation. Sign up for our newsletter. Feel free to have a click around on the community research site and let us know how we can be helpful to you. So once again, goodbye from all of us. Thanks very much for joining us for today's webinar. Looking forward to your feedback and your comments and we'll see you next time. So bye from us.